So welcome everyone and good morning for those of you on uh, East Coast uh, United States time. Um, it is my pleasure. My name is Brian Canada. I'm the chair of the computer science department at the University of South Carolina Beaufort, uh, which uh, has its main campus in Bluffton, South Carolina. And I'm also an associate professor of computational science. And I'm uh, happy to introduce uh, three speakers today as part of uh, session four, track two, which actually is, uh, is a two for one. You don't often get uh, BOGO specials when it comes to uh, when it comes to conference sessions, but uh, being that this is a conference about business and a lot of businesses offer a buy one, get one special, that's what you're getting today in this session. So uh, the first session, subsession, I should say, is on cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. And uh, we're joined by Mr. Richard Poland, who is the manager for cyber strategy at the Savannah River National Laboratory, uh, which is part of the Department of Energy and, and he's based in Aiken, South Carolina and also Michael St. Cross, who is the regional sales director for Elusive Networks. And I can't remember where Michael is calling in from. I thought I remember he said Maryland before, um, but I can't remember exactly. Uh, our second subsession will be Global Trends in Digital Infrastructure. Uh, Mr. C.B. Belayatan is the Global Managing mm -hmm. Director for Strategic Alliance for Equinix. So we'll start off with uh, Rick and Mike talking about cybersecurity and, I, and, cybersecurity and IT. Um, we didn't flip a coin backstage or anything like that, but I'll arbitrarily suggest that uh, Rick, you go first. Um, feel free to share your screen at your convenience. Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, as Brian said, <clears throat> I am the manager of the cybersecurity programs at the Savannah River National Laboratory. And basically my group's focus is to look at cybersecurity issues and do uh, research on those issues, uh, look at uh, ways to develop solutions to those issues for, for the uh, national government. Uh, I'd like to thank the, um, the uh, Business Summit for the opportunity for SRNL to present. We appreciate that. Okay, so uh, most likely very few people know about the Savannah River National Laboratory. So just a, a bit of a uh, orientation, the Savannah River National Laboratory is, is uh, located on the Savannah River site, which is in uh, the southeastern part of the United States. The Savannah River site is about 310 square miles. And on that site, we have numerous manufacturing facilities and decommissioned industrial sites uh, with those manufacturing facilities, we have mock-up DCS and SCADA systems. We have rail yards and switch yards. Uh, so basically a great deal of, um, of equipment and facilities that can be used to mock up, to test, uh, to do research and development for critical infrastructure, industrial controls and cybersecurity related issues. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity here with so much, so much uh, infrastructure that we have that we can do research and development on. So basically, uh, the group that my group came out of is tasked with developing those solutions. Uh, we have uh, worked for years on modern as well as legacy industrial control systems. So when we look at the critical infrastructure for the nation and the electrical grid, uh, we have that experience that we can apply modern cybersecurity uh, solutions to uh, both modern as well as legacy uh, infrastructure. So we do this for uh, certainly national security and defense. Uh, critical infrastructure, as I mentioned, but not only that, also uh, the manufacturing and industrial base. When we stood up the program about four years ago, uh, we didn't, uh, didn't intend to just, well, what we did was we looked at what the, the government considered to be critical. Uh, we looked at the executive orders that the presidents had put out regarding cybersecurity and then we also looked at the DOD, DHS, and DOE multi-year plans and strategies 
Uh, and then we developed our own governing documents from that for our, our program. So again, talking about the foundation, uh, we certainly have the experience and expertise on industrial control systems. Uh, we have an active portfolio on grid modernization and the resiliency of that. So directly relating to cybersecurity research and development in that area. Uh, industrial control systems and the Internet of Things in production, in manufacturing and in industrial settings. Um, so the industrial control systems, security architecture, we're presently on a program, a new facility we're building at the site where my group is actually designing the architecture for the cybersecurity of a complete uh, brand new industrial control system. Um, also, uh, we have a group of uh, electronics designers. Uh, so we have designed a number of electronic devices for cybersecurity applications, uh, one being the authenticated sensor interface device shown in the, in the picture there. Uh, that basically uh, will take data from any sensor, uh, be it analog, digital, whatever, and then uh, authenticate and encrypt that signal and send it on uh, and, and protect the device from being hacked um, and the data from being hacked. So as we set up the program, uh, we were very fortunate that the lab director saw this as a key area that the lab should be investing in. So we invested in considerable infrastructure uh, as well as personnel and training. Uh, as you can see here, we set up what we call the SRNL Critical Infrastructure, ICS in Cybersecurity Laboratory. Uh, there are pictures to the right, uh, our, our uh, pictures of our lab. Uh, the real purpose of the lab is to, I was just checking my time here, looks like I'm doing okay. Uh, the real purpose of the lab is to, to have the hardware yet be able to virtualize the, uh, a greater extent, a greater capability than we are able to uh, do with the hardware. So what we have done, uh, we, have, um, we have hardware in the loop capability where we have two substations, uh, transmission and distribution relays and all the associated equipment that we tie in with uh, an RTDS where we can simulate larger grids, electrical grids. And then we also have that tied to uh, human machine interfaces, DCSs and SCADA, and as well as enterprise networks. Uh, in the lower right, you see a server rack there where we have VMware, where we can simulate um, uh, enterprise networks as well as OT networks. Um, and we can, uh, as it says there, we can model grid as well as factory floor. On the bottom center picture to the right of that, uh, that set of racks is where we have racked up our ICS. So we have PLCs and other instrument uh, control system components there that we, so we have both the, the grid as well as ICS uh, for hardware in the loop activities. So uh, research focus areas, SCADA, vulnerability assessment, ICS penetration testing, electrical grid resiliency, GPS manipulation. GPS, uh, a lot of the critical infrastructure is based on GPS timing. Uh, so we, we have a GPS uh, simulator and we're looking at how that affects various, uh, various uh, critical infrastructure. So in the future, as we build out more capabilities and, and build out that expertise in the cybersecurity world, we intend to uh, focus on some additional areas, 5G and 6G security, certainly applying basically proactive discovery with uh, machine learning, AI, and big data for cybersecurity activities, and then national energy industrial security. So we didn't want to do this by ourselves. We know it's a big problem and often there's stove piping that goes on. So one of our key 
focuses was that we create a collaborative environment, uh, especially in the southeastern United States, but eventually around the nation where government, academia, and industry are all working together, collaborating together, and communicating the solutions as well as uh, the, the, uh, the needs. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we've set up. We've made great progress in the last uh, few years with this. And again, I appreciate the opportunity. And I think I've held to my, uh, very close to my 10 minutes. So uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, that was very, very interesting. And uh, selfishly, I, I, uh, I find um, a lot of what you're talking about particularly interesting to me. My, uh, in my former life, I was a chemical engineer and I worked very closely with, uh, with, the, with the controls folks uh, in ExxonMobil. Uh, both in the research engineering organization as well as in their uh, refining organization. So I, um, it's been a while since I did any work in that area, but uh, but it's uh, but it's cool to to uh, speculate about um, how some of those technologies that I took for granted as an engineer, a young engineer, um, are definitely critical for um, for cybersecurity as well. So uh, we will come back to uh, to Rick after our second speaker. Uh, gets a chance to uh, talk about what, what uh, he's doing at Elusive Networks and, uh, and his perspective on cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. So again, I want to welcome uh, Mr. Michael St. Cross uh, from Elusive Networks. And uh, just as a reminder, um, if you have questions about either Rick's work or uh, what Michael is talking about today, uh, please, answer, please ask your questions in the Q&A um, and there's a special link for that at the bottom of your Zoom panel. So, uh, Michael, please take it away. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, and again, uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to share some details about Elusive today. Uh, again, you have Mike St. Cross, and I uh, do cover the kind of the Eastern uh, U.S. for the company. Um, so, Elusive Networks is focused on stopping attacker movement, uh, and we do that by you know creating a hostile environment for attackers. Uh, you know, what we see in the uh, market today that's making headlines is there's a high concentration of ransomware attacks. Um, you know, so essentially cyber criminals are uh, trying to exploit as much infrastructure as possible today uh, to encrypt it and hold uh, environments hostage. Um, and you, you've seen some great impacts with that, even with the universal health systems breach that uh, essentially put hospitals out of operation to the point where people couldn't have critical procedures and and there was someone who actually died because of uh, that shutdown of their environment. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, you know, activity uh, still, uh, people are, you know, chasing alerts and that's not necessarily a productive uh, way of, of operating in cybersecurity. Um, and with the pandemic economy, you definitely have uh, a higher um, risk of insider threat. Um, and, you know, again, there's a, a huge rise in, uh, you know, false positive alerts uh, because the, the behavior patterns of our work operations have changed with the uh, remote work uh, capabilities and that expanded attack surface. Um, the system that's being used to perform work today is also being used potentially to, you know, for personal use at night and it doesn't have the same uh, level of security. So it's much more susceptible to attacks from nation states and uh, cyber criminals. And uh, finally, with, with uh, the security market in general, everything is based on putting a new agent on an endpoint. And uh, we think that model uh, is, is not effective uh, because agents are detectable by malicious actors. So it's, it's really a losing game for cyber defenders today. Attackers only need to be right once, whereas all the tools that uh, people are investing for in cybersecurity that focus on indicators of compromise, uh, file hashes and behavior analysis, um, they're not getting it right, right? The um, level of breaches that go undetected are over 91% of them reported in the last year did not generate a real alert that led to the detection of uh, the actual malicious action. Um, so people need a bit more effective way of uh, you know, actively defending their infrastructure. 
So from an elusive perspective, uh, you know, we're focused on, you know, bringing about this triple zero world where there aren't any accounts that can be compromised by attackers. There are no false positives uh, wasting, you know, uh, cyber defenders time and also no time wasted um, on slowing down the, you know, containment and eradication of, of positive events that are detected in the environment. Uh, we're doing this by shrinking the attack surface. Uh, what's being used by particularly advanced ransomware is, is lateral movement. Um, you know, they land on an endpoint, get control of an account and then connect to the network and, you know, start finding pathways uh, to move laterally to gain privilege and then compromise infrastructure. Uh, we also want to create the illusion of an expanded attack surface, make it hard for the attacker to make a safe choice, and finally provide much better uh, visibility into the telemetry of what's actually happening during a malicious action. Um, you know, just to complement um, uh, Mr. Poland's uh, content today, there, there really are uh, federal standards today that are looking at cyber resilience uh, in the NIST 800-160 uh, volume two really gets into, um, we have primary effects like monitoring, but we need secondary effects um, to give us, you know, more cybersecurity continuity. And one of these uh, effects is deception, which is what Elusive does. And there are new controls in NIST 853 release five that uh, instantiate um, those deception controls. Um, and also for the defense industrial base, uh, there is requirements for similar capability now with the uh, special publication 800-172. Similar uh, cyber resilience focus on deception, attack surface reduction, and high value asset protection. So, you know, Elusive uh, looks at the uh, <clears throat> enterprise network the way the attacker does. Uh, we're looking at how the endpoints communicate. Cyber defenders typically look at the network and network zones and the logging and the activity, whereas we're taking that attacker view um, because the attackers want to get to credentials. They want to uh, dump those credentials maliciously and then use that to move laterally. So our system takes a look at the, the same view, uh, how things are connected, particularly identifying crown jewels, what grants access, what, what is a critical data store or in the uh, uh, power generation uh, world, uh, what is a control system, what can influence the integrity and availability of infrastructure. But essentially we're, we're looking for what's exploitable and we're removing it. And we do this in an automated manner. Uh, at that same time, we're also planting deceptive artifacts um, and even full deceptive systems um, to entice attackers to engage. And it's on a high probability model and that, you know, at a 95% saturation rate, um, 19 out of 20 artifacts, breadcrumbs on these endpoints, whether they're cache credentials or cache connections are deception. So when there's an engagement with a deception, it is a positive detection because uh, privilege was abused to gain access uh, to this data set and therefore an alerts generated and a full forensics view is captured with full system telemetry of what volatile data set is present, as well as what non-volatile activity is uh, recorded on that system. So this brings a huge efficiency to, to be able to capture what's happening at time of alert in less than a second and uh, have this full perspective uh, versus you know, manually pulling stuff all the time. Uh, in a recent example of ransomware attacks, uh, one of our customers uh, was notified by law enforcement that their environment was compromised, accounts were being sold in the dark web. Uh, so they immediately, um, you know, increased their deployment of, of Elusive's capabilities, uh, particularly around their, their critical assets, their crown jewels. And within just a few hours, you know, the, the malicious actor was uncovered. The, um, they bid on a deceptive artifact on a print server, which was a remote uh, desktop protocol session that had admin privilege. And that exposed that, you know, this was a trick bot uh, orchestrated event uh, based on the callbacks outside of the company with the RDP, uh, as well as um, the group running it was the Fin6 group, a well-known advanced persistent threat uh, that were using tools like Cobalt Strike, Metasploit, Mimikatz, Bloodhound, Sharpound, to uh, really uh, proliferate in the environment. 
Well, it's interesting in, in this uh, ongoing event, there were several high uh, risk threats that were um, leveraged here. You know, the previous compromise was undetected. A user account was compromised, which led to authentication and privilege access compromise, establishing command and control. Uh, malicious configuration changes were performed to take control of domain controllers um, and have admin privilege to encrypt data stores with a uh, concealed binary. Um, so, you know, the undetected activity, uh, deception is really the most effective means, you know, to uh, force the attackers to reveal themselves. And that's what, you know, Elusive is doing that's different, that changes the model and really provides more effective protection of critical data sets. And I'll leave it at that. Terrific, terrific. Well, thanks to both of you, um, both Rick and Mike for uh, providing some perspective uh, on what's happening at the uh, sort of infrastructure level, particularly when it comes to uh, things like our electrical grid and other things that involve uh, distributed control systems, as well as uh, what, what Mike was talking about as uh, uh, specifically elusive networks is um, unique, I guess, approach uh, to, uh, to cyber defense. And uh, so I don't see any questions uh, coming up in the in the Q&A section just yet. Um, so as a reminder to our audience, if you do have any questions about what Rick or Mike talked about uh, today, uh, please enter them into the Q&A. Um, but I'll go ahead and get us started with, uh, with, some, with a couple questions for, for Rick and for Mike. Uh, are, are we gonna let CB present or are we gonna do the Q&A before CB? Um, what I thought we might do is, uh, you know, treat Rick's and Mike's session as sort of being relatively self-contained. Okay. Um, but right. certainly if, if audience members think of questions for Rick and, and Mike uh, a little bit later on, um, they're certainly welcome to do so. And uh, if possible, just make a note, note in your question if you have, if you're asking a particular a question, particularly to Rick or to Mike. Um, but since, uh, since the topic, since these particular topics of, of cybersecurity are fresh in the audience's mind, um, let's, uh, let's proceed with a little bit of Q&A for, for, for them. So I'll start by asking, uh, what, do, what, do you think the, what do you think the audience should know about how the COVID-19 pandemic in particular has affected your, um, your, your companies or your firms cybersecurity priorities and strategies on a day-to-day -day basis. What do you think the audience should know about that? Well, I guess I'll jump in. Um, you know, what, what we're seeing is uh, just a, a higher escalation of, uh, you know, the cyber criminal and nation state activity um, because there's now a new access point to exploit. And, you know, they're really focused on uh, spear phishing attacks, uh, as well as uh, malicious site downloads to gain a foothold on that work from home system. Um, that's the, the major threat vector that's being exploited today, just with the increased activity. And you see it, you know, even as part of the presidential debate, um, there was the dialogue before the debate started about you know trick bot and election tampering um, that same platform is, is being used to generate these massive spear phishing campaigns so you know the cyber attackers are trying to get a foothold for that first move and then come back later um, and further exploit it uh, but there's a big land grab happening uh, today that you know we just haven't seen before you know it's like a 600 percent increase in activity We don't. Uh, my group doesn't necessarily monitor those types of um, those types of activities. But as far as research and development, um, we've done rather well at keeping the team cohesive as we telework. Um, but in a research and development environment, it takes it takes togetherness. It takes cohesiveness, being together, exchanging ideas, working together. Um, although we've remoted equipment to, uh, to folks' homes, they've done home labs with the equipment that they've taken home. 
Uh, and we've made good progress, but I think progress has, has slowed because of COVID and because of uh, people needing to uh, work remotely. Uh, I know that might not be such a popular, um, might not be such a popular stance, but um, I think in, in research and development, it is quite important to have that uh, critical mass of knowledge and engineers in, in one place exchanging ideas, uh, helping each other solve problems. Um, so I'm very excited to get my team back to work. And, and there is migration back here, but I'm excited to have the entire team back and everything back to normal some year, hopefully some month rather than some year. Terrific. Thank you for your perspectives on that. Um, there is one question in the Q&A uh, section uh, from a Rishi Muli. Rishi asks, do you see any possibilities of getting cybersecurity collaboration centers like a security operations center or SOC set up in India? Would you care to comment about that at all? Yeah, most definitely. I think, uh you know, having that um, cybersecurity operation center collaboration uh, between, you know, the, the U.S. Uh, focused companies uh, and India, it, you know, really brings an advantage. Um, not, not only is there more of a 24-7 coverage ability, but there's, you know, also, um, you know, applying the principles of, um, you know, cybersecurity, cyber defense um, collaboratively, you know, across countries. And I, I think the, you um, there, there is, you know, an information sharing um, necessity specific to a geography, um, but you know, the same lessons learned in the U.S. Uh, are going to be valuable to to the Indian market as well. Um, so, you know, I do definitely do think there's a lot of potential for that. And we at SRN are beginning to branch out to some of our. Um, international collaborators. Uh, certainly we have to be a bit more careful possibly than a commercial company, but um, certainly we have those relationships and would consider um, consultation on that as necessary. Terrific, thank you. Um, Rishi, I don't know if you're still online, but uh, if we didn't answer, if, uh, if you were hoping to ask a follow-up question, I encourage you to do so um, while we're waiting. I'll, uh, I'll continue the Q&A um, myself with a, with a couple of questions that I had in mind. Um, as a computational scientist and as, a, as an educator who um, is in charge of a computational science program here at USCB, um, we, we focus a pretty good amount of attention on high performance computing. And we, and we try to drill into the students that, uh, that high performance computing is something to take very seriously uh, because it is, very, it is critical to our nation's uh, economic competitiveness, our um, scientific leadership, as well as our national security. Um, would either of you have any perspectives as to how HPC can be better utilized in the, in the cybersecurity effort? Yeah, Brian, uh, this is Rick. Uh, we certainly are looking at that. Uh, we want to uh, get our base cybersecurity program established with um, funding partners. Uh, we're, we're expecting to have that this fiscal year. And then uh, I think in my presentation, uh, one of the last slides, we did talk about AI and, and machine learning and those types of um, those types of things, those types of applications that will use high performance computing. We actually have here at the laboratory, a high performance computing group, and uh, it is in our digital transformation uh, directorate, which uh, we are a part of as well. So we do intend, uh, we've been speaking with them. Uh, they are um, presently uh, beefing up their, their their high performance computing uh, staff, as well as uh, AI and ML personnel. So we have been talking with them. Uh, we do uh, 
we 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 worked with uh, Venkata Alturi, I believe it is from uh, Alabama A and M. I think it was. Uh, he was with us a couple summers ago, uh, looking at uh, doing some machine learning on uh, network traffic. So uh, we do expect with our our servers and our ability to uh, uh, model enterprise networks and such that we will be uh, doing some of that in the in, in the coming years. Terrific, terrific. Mike. Yeah, I was coming from an elusive perspective. Um, you know, our um, our parent and incubator organization is Team Eight Ventures, and Team Eight is definitely. Uh, focused on developing uh, new companies, um, particularly uh, in, in you know collaboration with uh, the Indian market. Uh, thus, our you know uh, interest to participate in the uh, session today with the Business Council. Uh, so I know there's uh, you know both investment uh, in Teammate, but also Teammate investment in incubating uh, new ventures in collaboration with uh, you know Indian-based companies. Um, you know it's you know a very broad topic, but I know that uh, that interest is there and, and some of those relationships are uh, being developed. Thank you, thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, Rishi, who asked, uh, he was the audience member who asked a question a moment ago, had a follow-up question. Uh, he'd like to know, how do companies like uh, his uh, get, uh, and Rishi, I'm, I apologize, um, I'm not sure if you're a he or a her, um, but uh, how do companies like Rishi's get information about uh, these kinds of collaboration opportunities? James, are you going to ask, answer that question? Sorry, jumped the gun too quick on that. Oh, okay. So yeah, the question is how do companies uh, get, uh, like Rishi's company, get information about collaboration opportunities? So. Um, Is that something that uh, Rick or Mike feel qualified to uh, to respond to? Otherwise, uh, if not, um, I can perhaps uh, point Rishi in the direction of maybe uh, one of the one of our conference organizers who has uh, um, particularly deep connections to to India. Sorry, I don't have any information on that, Brian. No problem. No problem. Uh, we have a few a uh, few more minutes uh, for for questions with Rick and Mike. Um, one of the things that I, uh, in doing some research for today's uh, present panel discussion, um, when I was doing some research, I um, came across uh, the concept of of hacking back, where perhaps uh, an entity, whether it's an individual or business, whose uh, whose network has been hacked, whose assets have been uh, compromised. Um, there's some legislation, potential legislation out there that um, if somebody has been hacked, this legislation, if it were passed, could potentially uh, limit the degree of criminal liability for the, the person who gets hacked to basically hack back or find a way, if possible, to hack back into their attacker system, um, almost as if to, uh, to seek revenge for, for being hacked. And I, I believe it's called the, uh, the Active Cyber Security, I'm sorry, the Active Cyber Defense Certainty Act or ACDC Act for short. Um, to the extent that, uh, that y'all are familiar with uh, that act or the potential legislation or the concept of hacking back in general, um, do you see if, if such an act were to be passed uh, and and thereby limiting criminal liability for uh, individuals or businesses to be able to reverse hack back into an attacker's network. Uh, is that good or bad for business or individuals? Any comments about that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll don't know if I can represent this as SRNL, but I think it's uh, I think it's an awesome uh, an awesome thought that um, you can counter attack. Um, now, how many companies have that? They may have to uh, go to Michael or, or some outside company and pay them to counter attack. But um, 
in general for, in, in in general as as a as a nation i see that as being beneficial but uh as a uh, as an individual company i it seems like it would be rather expensive uh, to make that happen yeah and i'll, I'll comment um, you know it's it's been interesting as um you know, we've really had a cyber offensive focus formulate through U.S. Cyber Command under the leadership of uh, General Nakasone. We, you know, we are doing, um, you know, counter uh, actions, you know, again, just as we've seen in the press over the last two weeks uh, of the efforts between Microsoft and U.S. Cyber Command to uh, really remove the TrickBot command and control uh, infrastructure from uh, Azure uh, dot com. Uh, many of the incidents, you know, at one point there was over a million command and control systems active, uh, launching the spear phishing attacks and, and malicious, uh, you know, download scenarios. Um, so, so we're definitely, you know, taking it to uh, the larger, more visible nation state or environments. But often these these uh, uh, actions are perpetrated through compromised infrastructure that you know is publicly available. Uh, so you're not actually striking the cyber criminals themselves. That's why we're outing them, you know, in the press. Um, that's why they're being uh, put on the, uh, you know, sanctioned list of individuals that can't visit the United States, for example. Uh, so I think as we, you know, put the pressure on governments and put the pressure on the individuals that are, you know, nation state attackers or, or cyber criminals, you know, that's the way to really strike back at them is to limit their ability to, uh, you know, do anything financially uh, outside of their uh, home nations and, and really limit their ability to travel. Um, you know, for an individual company to take action against uh, a cyber criminal organization, it might be um, pretty high risk that, you know, some, uh, you know, dark limousines would show up at uh, your business, or your home, and, and you end up in a trunk. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's best left to our governments to, uh, you know, protect us in the in the cyber realm. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, um, thank you for that. Uh, I certainly have uh, selfishly perhaps more questions of my own, but in the interest of uh, moving forward to our second sub session here, um, I want to uh, introduce Mr. C. B. Belayutan. Again, he is the Global Managing Director for Strategic Alliance with Equinix, and he's going to be talking about global trends in digital infrastructure. Thank you to uh, the uh, USA India Business Summit for this opportunity to uh, engage with all of you. I've been, you know, part of and been participating in uh, in some of the previous years uh, summits of uh, USA India, and I must congratulate the organizers for doing a, putting again another successful program as I've seen in the last years and all power and strength to this organization. And thank you for inviting Equinix and me in into this uh, for the session. I'm CB, CB Valaitan, and I'm part of um, Equinix and drive our, our global strategic alliances. I think as we talk about, you know, some of the trends in in the digital infrastructure world, you could almost argue that you always think there's never a better time to be able to talk about digital transformation. But with what's been happening around in the last year and now what we're going through now, it just almost amplifies the need for us to have these conversations and, and, and to also figure out and navigate as we look forward in terms of what's what makes organizations what are some of the ingredients to make an organization successful or even more successful but sometimes i'd even argue not just successful but even to just survive what are some of these uh, trends that you know we need to embrace as organizations just to survive so we in equinix believe in the power of what we call as a digital advantage and uh, the ability to survive and to succeed we think hinges on that and so today, I just want to kind of give you all a brief uh, glimpse into how every organization, every individual and enterprise can actually fast track and accelerate their journey in this whole digital advantage and, and um, the world there. 
You know, the world today is, is digital, yes, but it's actually transforming just about everything that we know, whether it's markets, industries, any traditional models that we had, it's, it's all being transformed, which, is, which you might sound as a cliche, but it is something that the more we start reflecting on it, the more we realize, and then we can actually start figuring out what you need to do about it and what you need to land up uh, getting ready for your organization. When we mean that all markets are now global, we see that happening in that the traditional boundaries of borders, geographies, or continents and time zones have all are just being broken down. And you see organizations taking the benefit of this whole global market, whether it is streaming companies like Netflix and others, which take advantage of their content that can now be accessible globally whether it is e-commerce sites that can have products um, that can be also available to people. You're seeing the markets now truly becoming global and in terms of what it is. Economies are becoming shared, which in a sense means that you have ability to actually get a seller directly to be able to interact with users and be able to get, um, and also almost disrupt some of the traditional uh, industries that we were familiar with. For example, Uber uh, you know, distribute, you know, disrupting the transport industry or um, you know, some of these apps disrupting the travel industries. So some of the traditional businesses being uh, disrupted primarily by the fact that it's a shared economy and what we're doing. And last but not least, as we look at uh, the world today, information is actually becoming the biggest product that is actually saleable, that's available, and that's also accessible. So it lands up becoming so important that, and companies, even traditional companies that sometimes had nothing to do with um, you know, information as their key things is now using information to become front and center of what they do. For example, with IoT available now, you have sensors that are able to kind of be incorporated into any of the traditional products, thereby not just value adding the product, but being able to give some key information back to the, um, the suppliers and the manufacturers about their products, which helps them to be able to um, you know, get their products better, be able to look at, you know, events that are happening, utilization and all kinds of elements there. And also you have companies that use and sell just information, whether it's in the financial sector, whether it's in, um, in the weather, whether it's stocks, whether it's just about anything that you look at today, that's becoming a key part of, uh, you know, what it is. So if these are some of the trends that's happening, what does that mean for companies? You know, what does that uh, land up uh, becoming for any company? and especially companies that have not yet embraced the path on uh, digitalization is that a, you know, everybody needs to be able to figure out how to launch digital products and, and, and actually be able to scale that globally. And because the advantage comes from the scale of being it global, it's not just about catering to a local or a small market, but being able to scale that and be able to access and make that accessible globally. And because all users are going to be actually interacting digitally, we need to have a very superior digital user experience, which is very key. And it's very different from the kind of traditional user experiences we've had. <clears throat> and also because the nature of demand, the nature of where it's being consumed is different. You need to have the ability to be able to scale up and down your product availability digitally so that you can, you can spin that up where it's needed, spin it down and be able to then spin that back in into another place. For example, if you've got a sporting event, then you need to be able to bring in capacity into that place pretty quickly and then be able to bring that down and then take it to the next place where there's a demand here, whether it's an entertainment or, or any other event like that, a mass rally and or some event that's going on. So you need to be able to do all of that. So that's in a sense pretty key for what the markets today are and what we need to do about it. Now with, with those being some of the elements of the market and what, the, what a digital leader needs to do, if we are able to get to do all of this as what we call an Equinix additional advantage, it actually is, it not only, like I said, gets you to you know, succeed, but it's a, it's a key advantage of being able to survive in, in your own way. But it also then just gives you agility. It helps you to be able to launch products because user demand is now so interactive and online, you're able to launch them products pretty quickly and also be able to get that, to be able to service that as quickly as you can. Uh, the digital user experience can be a big differentiator in terms of just what a customer is going to be able to experience off your, um, your products and solutions and where it is. 
you also land up being able to gag, you know, just multiply the value of just not your product, but the entire ecosystem that develops around it. I mean, when you look at an e-commerce system, you sell one product, but it's just not that one product that you're selling that, you know, you affect, but it's a whole ecosystem around it, which can actually get triggered around it, whether it's you know, after sales maintenance, other associated products, you have the ability to do that pretty elastically. And that's a key thing on it. And again, by just having practiced some of that, you land up getting going ahead to be having the knowledge and the skill to say that you can launch new products and be able to drive that and be able to get that and, uh, and launch that, not just with confidence, but be able to do that in a sustainable model once you know how to be able to get that going and for you on it. So, so going on and into just taking a peek around then into you know, what the markets today are over where are we today, if we wanted to go in into this digital advantage you know is that is that an easy thing to do or you know how easy or difficult is that for us to do the first thing that everybody needs to realize is that you know for you to for any company to be successful you need to have the infrastructure that helps to create this digital advantage it's absolutely critical for us to do that and it's actually easier said than done because for us to be able to create that foundation, we're actually creating this foundation mostly for most enterprises. It's coming in from a very traditional base that they're used to. So for them to convert this traditional base and traditional infrastructure into a digital infrastructure is a huge challenge. I mean, the COVID times now have of course brought this front and center because some of the traditional methods of how we've been used to doing business no longer exist, whether it's going face-to-face, -face, traveling, or sending stuff in and, and engaging with people. But even before this, you know, organizations had such strong legacy uh, infrastructure that it was a big mind shift for people to be able to do that and drive it. It's not just tra traditional infrastructure, but it's also just things like computing. I mean, I talked about some of the events that are happening where you need to be able to spin up and down. The whole element of having central databases and the ability to do that is actually now diminishing in value and things are actually coming in more and more out to the edges, closer to where the users are. That's another element that's happening. And for us to be able to be successful in this new world, every organization needs to be able to be able to be interconnected with others. The power of the network effect is so profound that people who can actually take advantage of that is the ones that they're going to be able to do that. But to do that, you know, there are some things that you do need to uh, kind of take into account. One is, as you can see, data is just exploding. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, you know, that is one thing that's a given. The challenge with data explosion is that there's a lot of data that's actually getting real-time generated. Over 30 to 40% of the data is all being real-time video that's being generated. So you do need to be closer to where the data is being generated. 80% of the data is video. So again, just the demand in terms of just how much you can compress and move data around in the internet, it puts a huge demand on it. For this and for the user experience that I talked earlier about for us to be able to do that, is that you've to go, got to get the data closer to where the, the user is and where you're gonna be consuming it. Any distance actually lands up creating latency and that starts becoming very perceptible. And these things can actually have a huge impact in terms of just what uh, any user experience is and what it can do to the success of your organization. It's just not that. So for example, if just a little bit of latency and or some of the TCP IP uh, throughput that you get on a traditional internet, by just putting some of that, the bandwidth and the throughput of a data can actually go down by 25x. So you can imagine you know, how much it can degrade uh, capacity in terms of where it is, especially now when, I, like I said, video being so high. And now when video goes from, from 4K to 8K and some of the more advanced technologies, the bandwidth is going to go up, experience is going to be the user going to get a demand experience, and then you're landing up slowing it down. And even if you land up getting in data across and because data has got to be all over the place, just, just things like transport costs and others start becoming a huge part of your network spend. And so that's another one that people need to um, kind of keep in mind in terms of where it is. So for all of these things to, you know, to counter all of this, you then start realizing what you do need is a, you know, a finely tuned hybrid system that's platform that you need is what you need uh, from to be able to solve some of these things in terms of just what you you know want to solve and where you want to go about it. 
um, we in Equinix, you know, having um, worked with, um, you know, all the leading enterprises of the world and all the hyperscalers, I think that, you know, we have a unique perspective and a view of just not just where we are today, but also where the, uh, the future of this, uh, of the infrastructure market is actually going to be heading in. While it, while it might look probably simplistic, I mean, it's, these are some of the things that we would like every enterprise which wants to go on a digital um, you know, track to be able to further their digital advantage needs to keep in mind. The first and foremost thing is that infrastructure is just about everywhere. The traditional view of thinking of enterprises as having central IT uh, data centers is gone. So I, we think the corporate data center is uh, is just shrinking in size and it's going to become less and less important in terms of the element of moving data between the central data of uh, centers and the edge data centers in terms of where it is. The data has to be distributed. That's just the first thing that every enterprise needs to keep in mind. The second thing is that when you talk about infrastructure, you know, the cloud used to be the big uh, it almost seemed like it was the answer to most solutions or most problems. That was it. But frankly, the cloud is not an end game or is not a destination, but it is just part of what you need to kind of consider as you develop your infrastructure. And this is an important one for any enterprise that thinks that, you know, if they want to just figure out how they distribute that they could put everything on a cloud. There's a huge issue and some of the issues that even the previous panelists were talking about, whether it's security, whether it's availability and others, lends us to consider that it cannot be a, a you know, either or, it's gotta be a combination and cloud is just one part of that in terms of where it is. You know, I talked earlier about hybrid and the poor element of also is in fact earlier is about infrastructures, not just cloud or your own self. You know, the workloads hack cannot just be in one place, but it has to be moved further and further to the edge where users are and where they're going to be experienced. You also need to be able to have the ability to be able to deploy them rapidly and then redeploy and move them around. So the whole world of, and including the world of security, it's all about hybrid. So that's another key thing that uh, people need to keep in mind. And last but not least is ecosystems that you need to be able to keep them successfully. You need to have them connected the interconnection, if, if the more you're connected with the other players, the hyperscalers, the more successful you'll end up becoming. And the more private, the more direct you're able to have an interconnection, these element to successful, um, you know, enterprises of the future can come in. So to just kind of summarize that, you know, <clears throat> You what what any enterprise needs to be to be successful is an is a platform that can actually have the ability to house a hybrid IT infrastructure. It needs to have access to ecosystems and tools to be able to get that working. And last but not least, it has to be able to cater to the flexible consumption models, which are the the need of the day today. That's easier said than done. Also, because like I said, sorry. Like I said, because today's organizations do land up being chained down by some of their traditional legacy ways of how they work and how they build. And that's where I think just to kind of leave that in with uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the participants and people who are actually thinking about how to get their digital advantage. We in Equinix are proud that you know, we believe that we provide a platform that can bring the right play that is in the right places brings in the right people and the right uh, possibilities for you to be able to get uh, successful in, in terms of just uh, making you successful. So uh, to summarize, for any enterprise to be successful, you need to be in the right places, which is almost being global. You need to be able to have the right ecosystem, which is to have the right partners. And last but not least, be able to enable, create, generate the right possibilities and do that in a way that's flexible, which is uh, what users today need. And that's where we see infrastructure going and companies which can do that successfully are the ones which are gonna be able to take the benefit of the digital advantage. So thank you very much. Thank you again for this opportunity. Great, thank you, CB. Um, really appreciate your, your perspective on on uh, uh, global trends and digital infrastructure. <clears throat> I want to uh, allow for uh, some of the folks in the audience to 
uh, squeeze in some Q&A here. And uh, Rishi Muli, who uh, asked a question in the previous subsession, has a question similar to the way major companies like Google and Facebook have done, is Equinix planning to invest in India, like for setting up edge data centers? Yeah, a great question, Rishi. Thank you for that. Um, India, uh, not just for Equinix, but India is one of the most exciting markets in terms of this data growth. Uh, it's um, got the second largest number of internet subscribers. It's the fifth largest economy in the world. And uh, so a market that Equinix has been very keenly, um, you know, wanting to be part of. And so we're very happy to, um, you know, let you all know that just two months back, we actually made an acquisition and an entry into India by acquiring GPX, uh, which is one of the leading data center companies in India. So through that, we are excited to be able to bring all our global customers who have been talking to us to want to get into India, to be able to come in and uh, be able to take the benefit of the Equinix platform, and also to be able to tap in into this revolution that's happening in India, whether it's e-commerce or any of the other activity that's going on, and the companies in India to be able to access the uh, global uh, network that, that we have. So we are excited to get into India now and uh, really, really look forward to seeing how we can actually extend um, our advantage in India and, and tap into that market to help that market grow even more. Terrific, thank you, CB. Uh, Rishi, I hope that answered, uh, answered your question. Mm -hmm. Feel free to ask a follow-up in the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, CB, if you don't mind, uh, I have a question for you. Um, as an instructor in, uh, in computer science classes and related coursework, um, you know, there's, there's been a push to try to take a lot of what we're doing and, and move it to the cloud. Um, and, and I'd personally love to be able to do all my coding in the cloud, uh, just cause I, I personally don't want to have to maintain <laughs> my own infrastructure. Um, but, and, and I think that's one of the real benefits of having a cloud, a cloud-based infrastructure is that you don't have to worry about maintaining anything yourself. Are, who would, who would you recommend, like what kinds of businesses or other entities would you recommend uh, not pursue a cloud-based uh, strategy or an edge computing strategy uh, and instead, you know, maintain all of their assets and infrastructure essentially on site or at least within their, their own firewall? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Brian. And I think, um, um, you know, a, a very valid, uh, uh, you know, topic for just for about any enterprise and, and you said, you know, even a company, you know, people like you who's you know, either doing your own personal work and are or trying to get your, you know, your, your, your institutions work and to figure out the best way to do it. We think, we think from an Equinix perspective, the, the, the question is, it's not like, I mean, as you said, it's not about who should keep them in their private. We think it's not a question of an either or, it's actually a question where you've got to look into all the factors that come in into figuring out where your data has got to be in. And some of the rules that you've got to kind of make sure that you've got to take the boxes and looking at it is, is your data going to be global? Do you need your users and data to be actually available and accessible to people globally and you want it to be available for them? Do you want it to be flexible that you can spin it up and down where you needed it to be able to go in? And do you need to take the benefit of just not just your own data, but of an ecosystem that's available for you to take benefit of? And if you start you know, kind of checking some of these things, then you would probably come to a point where you realize it's not either or, but you've got to have a combination of both of these, which is why we in Equinix are a very strong believer, like I said, that the cloud is not an end by itself. It's just part of the overall uh, solution that you need to have. And at the same time, having all your data and your infrastructure on premise, which is what traditional companies, enterprises used to have is also not the answer because the flexibility that it does not provide, it, it does provide advantages of security and ability to control your own data, but it also does not provide some of the other advantages that I said. So we strongly believe the world that has to go in, in going forward to be able to get the digital advantages through a hybrid architecture that needs to take elements of what you need to keep secure in your own premise 
but at the same time be able to get the advantage of of the uh, public and private um, cloud and the ecosystem that's available. So um, Equinix provides a platform where you can still keep your uh, your infrastructure secure and then be able to have some direct access in into the uh, into an ecosystem of web scalers, hyperscalers, and other partners. So it provides you almost the best of both worlds in a sense. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, for that perspective. So we have about uh, three minutes or so um, before we have to transition to the next session at, uh, at one o'clock. And so if there's anybody in the audience that wants to try to squeeze in one more question, feel free to do so. Um, while we are waiting, um, one more question I might have for, um, for CB. Um, so the iPhone 12 is coming out, which means that, you know, 5G, you know, for, for, the, for the general public, as far as the general public is concerned, they are finally starting to see 5G as entering the, the mainstream now. Um, but what should our audience know about uh, 5G briefly, I guess, and uh, particularly maybe how it relates to IoT, uh, as you described, or you mentioned IoT earlier in your presentation. So I wonder if you might have any perspectives on that. True. I think I think 5G is a great um, you know evolution of the fact that data is ubiquitous, data is growing, and data consumption by all of us is now something that we've not only taken for granted but we almost demand it to be available and have the same user experience that you've had on your laptop that you want to be able to have it anywhere you have. And so this is just an offshoot of that, and that it comes in. It's a, it's a wireless technology that helps you to get higher amount of data at uh, you know, much more capacity and also at a much more cost efficient way for you to be able to transmit that and be able to get that at a much lower latency. So that's what 5G promises and is able to do that. Telco operators today are rolling that out globally. We in Equinix are very proud to be able to work with all these telco operators and also the hyperscalers in being able to get data that used to be central now onto the edge so that as people start consuming this wirelessly and also by the wireline, wherever they are, you have the platform that can bring in and reduce latency and get this data to you available. So 5G is a, is a great way of just us really realizing that we just want to be able to have access to any data anywhere at, at, at any time. And uh, you know, it's, it's what we're gonna see going forward uh, being even more available across. Terrific, terrific. Well, thank you so much. We only have about a minute or so remaining. So um, what I'd like to do is, uh, to the extent that the audience is available, please join me in applauding um, all of our, our panelists, um, Rick Poland from uh, Savannah River National Lab, uh, Mike St. Cross from Elusive Networks, as well as CB Vilayatan from Equinix. So thank you so much to all of you. Thanks so much for being so gracious with your time and uh, being willing to participate. I, I found this particularly highly educational. Uh, would love to be able to stay in touch with you all, uh, for the longer term. And thank you all. Thank you, James, Brian. And thank you again to US India uh, Business Summit. Appreciate this uh, opportunity.